Yeah. Um, so uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Northampton. Um, I'm Marissa Elkins. I'm a uh, vice chair of the Legislative Matters uh, uh, Committee and uh, I'm calling this to order our uh, chair and uh, intrepid colleague, uh, Councilor Jarrett is not, I think maybe on the, the, the Zoom at some point, but is not, uh, wasn't able to be with us in person today. So I've been asked to, to chair the meeting today. Um, I first wanna start uh, by calling the roll. Okay. Councillor Elkins. Here. Um, Councillor Moulton. If you're calling me, Laura, I can't hear you, but I am present oh. remote. Can others hear me? Okay. And Councillor Nash. Here. <laughs> I'm still waiting for my update. All right. Um, I would just uh, uh, take a minute to announce that this meeting is being audio, or the Zoom is being audio and video video recorded. We do not have uh, uh, public access here recording this in person today, but I also, I guess for the record, for the sake of the record, would, would just demonstrate that nobody's here. Oh, is he back there? Oh, no. Nobody's here. Oh, yeah, but I also meant nobody from the public is here, so I mm -hmm. make the record clear. Um, we will start. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is uh, public comment. If anybody is, nobody is present in the room here, but if anybody is uh, here to speak uh, generally about public comment, anything not already on the agenda, uh, if you could raise your little zoomy hand. All right, seeing none, um, I will move on to the next item, uh, which is approval of the minutes um, from the April 10th 2023. Geez, it's been a while since we met uh, meeting. Um, do I hear a motion to approve those minutes? Uh, move to approve. Second. Jim has seconded. Uh, so if we could have a roll call, please. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Still unable to hear me, perhaps. Councillor Moulton? Yes, yes. Okay. And Councillor yes. Nash? You guys. Excellent. Those minutes are approved. Um, next is a public hearing, a community forum on, uh, on uh, uh, legislation and the issue of adopting Massachusetts municipal opt-in specialized stretch code. Um, and we have uh, a brief presentation by a uh, Climate Emergency Coalition member and personal hero, Adele Franks. May I share my screen? Uh, yes, I think Laura has done that. Okay, I'm gonna try that. Hmm, well, it's for some reason not working. I don't know why. Hmm. Oh, it, do you see this, the slides now? Yes, okay. you're, you're sharing now. Okay. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Adele Franks and I am a uh, retired public health physician, but so therefore I am not an energy code expert. Uh, but I've been following closely uh, the state's efforts to revise the uh, building codes, and I've been encouraging Northampton to adopt the specialized opt-in uh, stretch code. Whoops. Um, so I'm going to... I am going to uh, tell you about that. Um, first, I'd like to give a little bit of context. Back in 2021, the legislature passed an act called Driving Clean Energy and Offshore Wind. Uh, that was in 2021. Uh, it required a net zero building code, um, a stretch code. So Governor Baker objected to that and he vetoed the bill and he negotiated a compromise with the legislature 
such that the uh, quote net zero stretch code would be voluntary, not mandated. And then he asked his Department of Energy Resources to create such a code. And uh, DOER then developed over time uh, a new stretch code and a new opt-in specialized stretch code, which I've abbreviated OSS just for convenience, that municipalities could adopt but would not be required to adopt. And the fact that neither of them was actually net zero um, is, uh, I guess, beside the point because I think the legislature got tired of arguing with the administration and just accepted it. So uh, Massachusetts now has three building codes. It has the base code and the stretch code, the new stretch code, which really represents some really big changes from the previous stretch code in terms of the HERS readings required, the ventilation requirements, EV charger requirements, et cetera, et cetera. There are, uh, it's, a, it's a major upgrade in the stretch code for energy efficiency. And then the third code is the opt-in specialized stretch code, which is our topic for today. So uh, green communities have always been required to adopt the, the, the stretch code. So in this case, uh, green communities will be required to adopt the new stretch code, which is quite a significant change from the old. And of course, Northampton is a green community. We benefit greatly by being a green community. And we're in good company because over 82% of municipalities in Massachusetts are green communities. So we must adopt the new stretch code and it's being phased in and it will be fully in effect uh, in July of 2024. And we can, if we decide to adopt the new opt-in specialized stretch code, which will then become active six to 12 months after adoption. So the Northampton City Council is considering adopting the opt-in specialized stretch code. And that is the topic for uh, your consideration tonight. But the big question is what are the differences between the new stretch code, which we have to follow, and the opt-in specialized stretch code, which we can, if we decide to, um, adopt. So it turns out that for single family residences, less than or equal to 4,000 square feet, which is, I believe, most of the construction in Northampton, uh, there are two pathways provided by both the stretch and the opt-in specialized stretch code. And they're identical pathways. Uh, for all electric construction with requires a HERS rating of 45 or passive house certification. And for those homes built with mixed fuels, which in Northampton's case means propane because we're not allowed to um, hook up with gas for any new construction. There is a HERS rating required of 42. So you'll note that the higher HERS rating, which is easier to achieve, um, is for all electric um, construction. And that's designed to make it easier to build all electric because the state recognizes that we need to trans transition to all electric buildings. However, there are two differences between the stretch code, which we must adopt, and the opt-in specialized stretch code, which we're considering tonight uh, for dwellings, single family dwellings, uh, less than or equal to 4,000 square feet. If all electric, then the same requirements exist under the opt-in specialized stretch code as in the stretch code. However, 
for mixed fuel buildings, that is buildings with propane, uh, there are two additional requirements. They must have rooftop solar unless there's significant shading or other factors that make it not feasible. And they must be pre-wired for eventual electrification. And both of these could be seen as um, consumer protection uh, features because uh, rooftop solar will reduce the utility bills for the homeowners and also uh, being pre-wired for eventual electrification will reduce the cost for the transition, which will ultimately be required for all homes in Massachusetts. And for multifamily construction, um, for those buildings that are 12,000 square feet, that are over 12,000 square feet under the opt-in specialized stretch code, they must meet, such buildings must meet passive house standards and do pre-wiring for electrification if they're built with mixed fuels. So uh, how many communities are adopting this opt-in specialized stretch code so far? Uh, well, you can see here uh, those communities that have already adopted it, and they represent 18% uh, of the Massachusetts population, but you'll also note that they're all on the eastern side of the state. However, there are uh, central uh, communities located in the central part of the state and the western part of the state that are considering it, um, among them, obviously, Northampton. So why adopt the opt-in specialized stretch code? Well, Massachusetts is committed to be fossil fuel free and you know we have to make substantial reductions, 50% uh, in our emissions by 2030, et cetera. So all buildings will need to be converted to all electric. And uh, you know, to get there, Buildings will, new buildings especially, will need to be more energy efficient and produce renewable energy to offset the electrical loads of their buildings. So opt in specialized stretch code prepares buildings for that inevitable all electric future and saves uh, on future cost of conversion by requiring either all electric construction or pre-wiring for future transition. And it also prepares Northampton for the fossil fuel free pilot that has been uh, requested recently in a home rule petition to that effect. Uh, it, it's actually required that uh, communities to be considered for the fossil fuel free pilot um, adopt the opt-in specialized stretch code. And of course, it also it also encourages um, all electric construction and that will produce healthier buildings that are less expensive to run. So uh, I will stop there and uh, take questions. Um, can you use uh, stop? Well, stop share. Yes, I will try to do that. Uh, I may be able to do it too. I just don't. Uh, or if see. Laura can turn it off, I don't know. Let's see here. It says, oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. Um, so does anybody, let me ask, uh, is there anybody present um, on the Zoom, because nobody's here, uh, that has any questions right now for Adele? Yes. Uh, I can't okay. find the raise hand. This is Johnny Scarborough. No, that's okay. Pipe, pipe right in. It's a casual vibe today. One of the questions I guess I have, um, I had an upgrade to my house just a few years ago met the stretch goals, put in high efficiency boilers and everything like that. 
And I have a question as to, I was told I couldn't put solar on my house because of the trees that are out in front of my house, which are on city property, because I was told I had to have them cut down. And the solar company would not go ahead and go to the town and say, hey, we, he wants to put it. solar on, but, <laughs> but can't. You don't want to listen to this, do you? And, and one of the things I guess I have a question on is, if I have to, in the future, replace my current boiler, which basically I am gas, hot water heat, gas stove, only costs me $96 a month. My electric bill is very low. And I have, I'm just wondering, so what is my cost going to be? And I have to put in an EV outlet, which I'm not going to have. What are all these costs going to be to me? And is, am I going to be forced to go ahead and go all electric that I am currently gas? I don't know if anybody can answer that question or not, but that is my concern. Um, let me um, let me make this suggestion, um, and thank you, Mr. Scarborough. Um, I I'd like to come back to your question. I think um, I feel like uh, Lewis might have some insight into that. His hands are raised. In any case, okay. Can you, are you unmuted, Lewis? Yes. Um, do you want to hear it now or do you want to wait until a bit? Um, well, I'll tell you what. Um, I see that Eric has his uh, hand raised. Let me get to his question first because in sort of response to Adele's um, presentation and then we'll come back to you. And if you feel like you can answer Mr. Scarborough's or address Mr. Scarborough's question in the context of your remarks, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that would be the cleanest way to do it. So, uh, Eric. Thank you. Um, thank you, Adele and, and everyone. Um, point of clarification, just uh, you, you mentioned that mixed fuel would be propane because we have a gas moratorium. What about, uh, so is oil off the table? Uh, okay, so it, it could be oil fired. Okay. Um, and I think it, would, we, it might be hard to achieve the HERS ratings with oil. It, it may be. It may be. Um, I, I, our house is HERS rated. Um, I think it, it uh, I'm not sure how the HERS rating is affected by the heat. It's more a matter by the fuel source, its efficiency, and whether the building has a heat, uh, enough insulation to retain that. Um, as far as I know. Um, okay, uh, that's my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, oh, and also, um, if uh, you could, when you remark, just state your name for the record. Um, it's on the video, but um, say, just give us your name and, and your address. Um, I'm sorry, Eric Gardner, uh, 264 Florence Road. All right, and the speaker before that was Johnny Scarborough. Um, yes, Johnny Scarborough, Florence, Garfield Street. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a hand raised on the iPhone, the smart iPhone. If, if, if the, whoever that is wanted to identify themselves and make a remark or pose a question. I saw a brief. Unmuting and muting. Okay. Well, we'll whoever you whoever you are will um, you know if you figure if you uh, sort out your uh, your technical issues there we'll we'll come back to you. Um, so for right now though, um, why don't we go to Lewis who has some who also has um, some remarks and information for us. I'm not sure that I wasn't prepared to to uh, make a statement, but I, I I hoped to answer questions. I do have a 
Oh, uh, that's true. You, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, it does no. say that you'll be present to field general building code questions and provide technical support. So I am in my uh, sort of introduction, Lewis, to say, please take the floor to address what you can. Sure. So um, first thing to, that I'd like to say is that this energy code uh, changes are inevitable and that we are all going to deal with it in one way or another. And I support the idea of reducing uh, greenhouse gases, period, end of statement. The, um, I, that said, I think the, the current energy code is um, very, very, very complicated and beyond what a lot of contractors understand. Um, and without, I'm going to bash it a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to take the opportunity to say there's there's a phrase in the uh, one or two family residential energy code. Um, uh, Enthalpy, enthalpy recovery ratio. I have no idea what it is. I looked up that word and I still can't figure out how what they're addressing fits in and as I go through the energy code I'm spending a lot of time going back and forth and the building code has traditionally been evolutionary and this energy code the building code itself has been evolutionary and there have been some building code there have been some new additions that had more changes than others but this is this is a pretty amazing change, and I think people are going to have a hard time coming to grips with it. Um, I know that a lot of the resistance that contractors um, are having is that they don't understand it. Um, the The energy code has given the responsibility for planning and design to a lot of people who um, aren't people we're used to dealing. We've been dealing with HERS raters for quite a while, and uh, you can't build a new house without having a HERS rater help you design the energy efficiency aspects of it. Well, they've added two more, um, they've had, along with HERS raters, they've added two more um, uh, approval agencies. Um, and both have, both have something to do with passive houses. It's not clear what the difference is. Um, so people are now going to go to people that they don't know and have things presented to, to them in, in language that they don't necessarily understand. That's my biggest issue with the new uh, stretch code. What I think is really important is gonna to be to find some kind of a public source of information about how to deal with the stretch code. Um, and whether it's through the DOER and the, who are the people that uh, wrote the code or through the Board of Building Regulations um, who promulgate the code to find out what's happening. Um, and I don't want to go on a whole lot more because um, in some ways it's a transitional issue. Um, five years down the road, people will understand all this stuff, but right now they don't. And I think that's a lot of why there's a lot of resistance on the part of contractors and building officials too. Um, that all said, I put solar pan, I have, I built a house in 2003, I put extra insulation in it, I put solar panels on the roof and I went to air source heat pumps, took out an oil fired heating system. Um, the thing that, the thing that's, um, and it's wonderful, it's a wonderful house, it's, it is expensive, it costs more now than it did to heat. I, I, my electric bill, even with the solar panels, is higher than it was um, before um, I put in the, the um, significantly higher. And my energy costs are higher now than they were when I had oil heat. Um, and I worry that that's, um, and I spent a lot of money on the HVAC system, and I spent a lot of money on the solar panels. And I worry that people who are less affluent are going to really struggle with it. Um, but again, it's necessary. It's necessary that we figure out how to how to cut down on these greenhouse gases. And we're, if you could build to the code, to the current stretch code, well, I don't, I say current, we're in the, the um, 
one and two family stretch code first first version as soon as we go to the opt-in it'll tighten up um, if we build to those standards um, we'll have efficient houses but they'll be expensive and they'll be expensive to live in and i'm that concerns me um the um i do have um I wish that we'd put in a upper limit on size of houses. Um, I mean, one thing is a 4,000 square foot um, one or two family house is going to, you know, reminds me of back in the day when um, the automobile emissions first came out and people measured parts per million of tailpipe emissions. Um, and the reality was it should have been parts per mile. You get a big old Buick that put out a lot of exhaust. It might not have had a lot of parts per million of, of emissions, but there were a lot of parts coming out. A small car might have had more parts per million, but it didn't use as much energy driving a mile down the road. So I think at some point we're going to come to that concept, which is that it's the total cost of energy to live in a house as opposed to the total cost of energy of a house per square foot. So I'd, I'd encourage um, some kind of zoning that, in, that, and we have a little, to some degree, we have it in Northampton to, to encourage small houses and potentially even to restrict the large houses. Um, uh, Lewis, a, a question I have for you is, uh, or, and actually, this is for Adele too. Mm -hmm. The sort of the evolution of 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 this stretch. I mean, because it does. I mean, I I, I hear what you're saying about it being a transitional um, tool, and that it's going to evolve and change. Um, but I don't know the process process for that. Is it, is the legislature going to have to do like a whole new stretch code? Is it going to be sort of contained within regulatory? Um, rules changes what is what's the process for that well there would be um right now there's um the current massachusetts building code is the ninth edition and they want to change it to the 10th edition and they've been trying to promulgate the 10th edition of the code for years um so but right now we still are working off the ninth edition the the um which is based on the 2015 and 2018 International Code Council model codes. Um, the stretch code is based on the 2021 International Code. The 10th edition of the, of the State Building Code is going to go to the 10th to the 2021 International Codes. But right now, flipping back and forth between the 2015 International Code, the 9th edition of the Mass Code, the 2018 international energy conservation code the current stretch code the new stretch code um, and whatever comes after the new stretch code which is um, roll-ins the, the the cold rollout started with uh, january 1st 2023 then it went to july 1st 2023 it's going to go to um, it's going to change again in january of 2024 and then it's going to change again in july of 2024 so and at some point along the line, some of the conflicts between various uh, model code editions, which, which book you look in, um, but even in an optimal situation, we're going to be, once, once the 10th edition of the code is, has been promulgated, we're going to be looking in the building code, going to um, into, into the mass code. The mass code is going to refer us to one of the model codes with a couple of hundred pages of amendments. And then the mass code is the international code and the stretch code is going to um, direct us to the, to the energy conservation code and plus the, the DOER various versions of stretch codes. Um, and we're going to spend time administratively sorting out the conflicts in these various codes. I mean, there's there's a lot of conflicts, direct um, in, direct contradictions in the codes, and they'll get those. I mean, they'll get them administratively. So when you say we, do you mean contractors? You mean? Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Commonwealth of Massachusetts. <laughs> right. It'll I'm sorry, I think I just had a stroke while you were saying all no, that. It, <laughs> I, you know, it's, 
I'm being honest about it. I'm talking about what happened. Oh, no, that's not a criticism of you. No, that's no, it's, <laughs> so what the, ultimately the it appears that the Department of Energy Resources has, has taken the lead on writing the energy codes. They're, they're incorporated into the building codes. Um, but it, it seems clear that the DOER is going to be the people who, in, in consultation with the Board of Building Regulations, are going to tweak the energy code to make it match up better with the building code. And the building code people, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, are going to tweak the building code so it matches up better with the energy code. And will that require adoption of new, um, of a new code, like at the city level? And no, I don't think so. I think that oh, okay. there, there could be there could be enough of a change for it to come back to the for an, for another local adoption option, but I don't think so. I think that this will it it's the old stretch code lasted about ten years. Okay. So, all right, thank you. Uh, Rachel, you, looks like you have a question. <laughs> I'm doing that thing where I'm talking to myself. No, I was just going to clear, you know, it, I believe it's going to be um, reassessed every five years automatically. Every five years, it's, it's triggered to um, be assessed. And I do think that the confusion you're talking about, I, I believe it happened as because the OER is the one administering the codes for the first time and not BBRS. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they will work that out on the state level. And that's, and that's why we're rolling them in over a series of months. Um, mm -hmm. So okay. I hear you about that, but I believe the state's going to, you know, I think that the OER is, it's, and I think that, you know, it, it seems like the OER is not speaking the language that contractors are used to and, and as the new kind of, uh, administrator of the code, they need, you know, they need to work that out with, mm -hmm. come up with common language. I totally see that, but, um, and I, do, but I do need to push back that I was paying an average of a thousand dollars a month for oil last winter. So I guess it really, I guess part of it, what's hard about the assessment is, is really how volatile the market is. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I see other people have questions, so I'll stop mm -hmm. talking now. We can come back. And I can add. Yeah, I would just, um, um, Mr. Hanzel's had his hand up for, for a little bit, so um, I'm going to call on him and then I'll come back to, to pick counselors. Yeah, John Hansel, East Fall Metal. I, I'm building all my houses right now, fossil fuel free, uh, even though it's it doesn't. I'd like to know where Adele is getting these numbers that it's more economical to run something electric. I'm not doing it because I believe in it. I'm just doing it to appease. <clears throat> the planning department and some other people. Um, I found some bills that were so astronomical this past winter, one house that wasn't sold. And that was at Riverside Drive and nobody was going in the house. And um, the, the refrigerator was never being opened. There was no stove being run or dryer. Nobody was using the hot water and the house has R60 in the attic and uh, R, R25 in the walls. And in fact, the Louis, when he was a building commissioner, he saw how I insulated my houses. And I'm trying to get, how do you people wrap this around that it's more economical to go electric? I, I'm not following this. And if somebody could answer it, I'd really appreciate it. Hey, uh, John, just if, uh, and if you come back and speak again, would you, we, all we can see is like the bottom half of your face. There you go. Okay. I'm sitting we, in my truck. I, I, your... I, was on, I was on the smartphone, but I was driving a 91. So I couldn't connect for some reason, but uh, I apologize. <laughs> we we get we don't get to see your face very often, so it's always, you know, might as well take advantage now. Um, would uh, either with the um, a sponsor or Adele or anybody want to speak to that, Rachel? Yes, and I I just before I forget. Um, I would, it would be great if Johnny would clarify his question because I'm not sure if he was talking about a renovation. I wasn't clear about those terms, but that's for that question. For this, why it's, why it's cheaper is because we have these carbon goals we must meet. And so pre-electrifying, doing it, you know, not having to retrofit is going to be cheaper. So it, it's definitely less expensive if we're going to, you know, um, if we're going to decarbonize, we need to decarbonize buildings. And so that's 
And that's why, you know, the writing is on the wall with this. And we need a clear path to zero emissions. And this is the clearest, the more, you know, the clearest path to our, our both our local city uh, cli climate regeneration goals and to our state goals. That all sounds pretty, but you know what the cost involved in this is to build it that way? And everybody wants fossil fuel free, but they want affordable housing. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Exactly. So I think you talk about things like that, it just doesn't make sense to me whatsoever. And the cost is going to increase to build these houses. And it gets to a point where a builder can't make money. Well, they don't build. And I've talked to builders out there and their houses are all starting at like 1.3 million, 1.2 million. I mean, how many people can afford a house like that? It's my question too. <laughs> yeah, one, this is Johnny's well, Excuse me. Uh, sorry, actually, um, Johnny, I'm sorry, uh, if I could. There's a few few people that have had their hands raised for a I minute. So. I can't find the spot that it gets to raise the hand. No, it's okay. I appreciate that. Um, but um, So I have a note that, that you want to speak again, and I, I'm going to come back to you. But first, Thank I want to uh, hop over to some of the folks who had their hands raised for a while. Um, I uh, Between the counselors, I think I saw Counselor Labarge um as as being the first to so marianne oh you're muted sorry about that um okay. but i think mark patillo has been trying it looks like he wants to talk and i think he might be on the phone because he keeps bringing his name up i don't I don't see the iPhone person anymore. Huh. Okay. The iPhone person was me when I was driving. Oh, okay. That was me. So. John, John Hansel's iPad. I always know that guy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to make sure that the public speaks, and then I'll speak after them. Okay, th that's fine. I'll I'll come back to you to you, Marian. Um, um, I will come back to. John, your hand is still up. Do you want to? I'm not. A, I'm not coming back to you yet. But are you still looking to speak again? Okay. Um, uh, Stan, you, your hand is not up any longer. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to ask Louis a, a follow up about. He began his remarks, Louis, by saying that the current decode is is complicated beyond what most builders understand. You're referring to the basic code, the stretch code or the opt-in stretch code? Um, the, actually, the, it's shifted enough so that all three of them, the energy code, the new energy code uh, comes out of, uh, was written by the Department of Energy Resources. And they, it's more complicated than the old code. And it uses a lot of terminology that people aren't familiar with. And it's it's it, the, the goal is to cut back on um, is to make the most efficient house possible and a lot of the um, aspects of that efficiency are difficult are difficult to understand on some levels. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Eric, uh, you've had your hand back up again. Yes, um, thank you. Sorry, I gave my address wrong last time. 264 Old Wilson Road, Eric Brown. Um, on the question of cost, um, there was a there was an issue raised about it being cheaper to operate. And then also uh, the, a dispute about that. And then also the concern that it's much more costly to build. Um, I just this the issue of electricity versus other uh, fuel sources in the last year uh, is not it, it happened in, in such a way that it was cheaper to heat often with natural gas um, than it was electricity and that was because of the market the market anticipated that there was going to be a huge shortage of natural gas so natural gas prices went up there was not uh it's and and the i'm sorry so the electricity prices went up 
because of the forward going contracts brought forward by law and electricity went way up. Natural gas ended up not having a shortage of supply and stayed cheap. So you can't measure efficiency and cost over the last year based on what happened. It should improve for all electric heating. There is a, a very legitimate concern about the cost of building uh, with higher insulation value. The heating equipment will, will be about the same cost over time. Um, but, and then the additional electrical wiring requirements, that is a cost. Um, and I, I do feel that, um, that needs to be understood by developers. And if they're, and I, well, I don't have the numbers, but, uh, some developers can bring, present those. There should be some airing out of this so that we understand what happens with, with new buildings. What we're not taking into consideration, and I'll stop here, is the cost, the environmental cost. If you look at what happened in Hawaii and the fires in Canada, in Canada and the flooding. Those are all multi-billion dollar issues that are brought about by, as we know, increased carbon levels in the atmosphere. So we're not factoring in those. And, and this is a way to do that now. And I support it. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, Adele, if you can hold for just one minute, I'm going to do one more round to make sure uh, to hear if Mr. Scarborough wants to talk and if there's anybody else, and then I will hear from you and then see if we can't round round home on this. Um, Mr. Scarborough, do you, was there something else you wanted to say? Yes. Um, in regards to the building codes, when I had my house uh, renovated here, it was upgraded to the stretch codes that were at that time about eight years ago which is our uh, 30 something upstairs. It's 16 inches of insulation, six inch wall construction, et cetera. Now I have friends down in Florida, all electric houses. Their square footage is maybe 400 feet less than my house here. They're running their air conditioner for just last month and everything. Now, all electric, everything. $65 a month electric. Bill. So up here to try to run a house at that, I mean, even in my house, which I have all LED lighting, as I said, I have gas. My electric bill runs $90 to $125 a month. You know, I look at that cost and I understand the builders. They're going to have to put a lot more into it. It's going to cost a lot more for the house. I don't know how people will be able to continue to live here. I'm on a fixed income. I just do not understand. And I look at the cost of the electric here and it is far more than a lot of other areas. But that's where I, I have a big concern because I just don't see how people are going to be able to stay here with the current cost. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Scarborough. Um, I see uh, very quickly, I see that the mayor, who is a co-sponsor, co right, of this, um, is here. Uh, mayor, is there anything you would like to add to the discussion? I, I don't hear her piping in, but uh, I'll come back to her very quickly. Um, uh, Mr. Hansel, one one last brief comment, and if we can, and, and then I want to round circle the bases with the counselors and, and the mayor. I'm going to keep it very simple. How many of you counselors have ever built a house? How many of you counselors even know what goes into building a house? I don't think any of you. Nor does Adele, but she has all the facts and figures that she thinks she knows. I disagree with her. I read the one the home bill just did with MIT. Totally different result. 
So the thing is, I have a bunch of people telling me what to do and how I'm supposed to build a house who've never done it. It doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like um, to address the cost issue. Uh, yeah, Adele, I was going to call on you next before I went back to the counselors to close up the discussion. So um, I, I, I would certainly uh, be happy to um, provide the studies, including the recent home builders funded study, uh, which shows that in fact, it's cheaper to build electric, all electric homes. Um, and the, the home builders uh, funded study was um, picked up by the, um, well, picked up by the newspapers with very misleading headlines. And uh, they have since clarified their uh, point of view and what and their findings. And in fact, what they found is that the uh, the reason that um, the cost of building homes has gone so high is because of supply chain problems, because supplies are more expensive. It really has nothing to do with the actual construction being all electric versus mixed fuel or fossil fuels or whatever. So, um, so <clears throat> I would be happy to provide those references and um, um, I guess I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Adele. Um, Councillor Labarge. Thank you, Councillor. Um, number one, I want to say we built our house many, many years ago from scratch. It was all electric. We were paying three times more for electricity versus us converting to oil 10 years ago, 10 years ago. My question is, and I'm hearing from other people, and I just heard it again at this meeting, are people being forced to do this? And that's a big question here. Are our residents in the city being forced to do this? I'm very uncomfortable with this. I think what we heard from our building inspector, Louis Hasbrook, is exactly what people have been saying to me. Definitely, they find this to be a transition issue. A lot of people want to know why the city itself didn't put something in the Gazette, which they usually do, like when we have ordinances or resolutions, of letting people know about this meeting. I'm very surprised that that was not in the Gazette. And I think you would find many more buildings coming forth. I have talked with a couple of builders already. They were shocked to hear this. And what we just heard this contractor talk about is facts, what builders are saying, the cost and the expense is phenomenal. So I'm just saying as a homeowner myself and along with many other people that I've talked to, we converted our home which was all electric for many, many, many years. And at three times, all electric versus doing oil, a heck of a lot cheaper in our home. So I have concerns about this and hearing our building inspector of his concerns also, which is a lot of other people I talk to. I think the language is here is huge, huge to consume at one meeting here. I am hoping that this commission, this committee thinks about this very carefully and don't move it on to city council because I don't think it's really ready for this. I think we need to open it up more to the public, more to the public. And I think with the mayor's office, they could handle a, a good size meeting also. This is a huge drastic change in our city. And I am hearing exactly what I heard tonight at this meeting, are people being forced by the city again? So that's about it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council Labarge. Um, checking. Uh, Rachel, are you looking to? I was look. I was looking for my. I can't find my hand thing. I could find a clap. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'd okay. like to get in line to to. to uh, would you like me to speak now or? I, yeah, I think I, I, there, I, some want. hands back up again. Uh, yeah, so we'll. So see. here's the thing. I just yeah. because yeah. if just real quickly, so I can tell people yeah. my thoughts uh, on the discussion. So I, I what I'd like to do is to uh, Rachel allow you to answer and um, and I see that Jim has his hands up, and then I will make one last pass at uh, raised hands from the public, and then I think I'm going to close the 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 public this session um at, after that okay um so rachel if you go want to go ahead right i i'm i i'm wondering if councillor barge is un understanding and she's right it's incredibly you know complex and uh but this is for new construction um and you know very major major renovations at most i, I don't think in terms of residents being forced to do this that's not what we're talking about here that's not that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about new construction. And um, I, by the way, I just wanted to add in terms of cost, one thing that we haven't had a lot in this area has been cooling. And as the climate emer emer you know literally keeps up, we're going to need cooling. And so one another another way it saves money is that heat pumps replace both cooling, you know, central A A C and, and furnace. So that's another point about cost. But um, so I think I think that maybe I don't know what I think maybe there's some misinformation or or un, not understanding about what this does. I mean this the, the really the difference between this and the code that we would automatically adopt is some amount of hers rating and the solar um, the, the requirement to add solar if if it's um, if, if there's not if there's not too much shading, but it's it's actually not it's really not. Uh, besides the, the, the HERS rating, um, it allows for mixed fuel. It's actually quite modest, and it's really not that radically different from the code that we already have. So I think maybe there's some fear. And I, I totally hear, uh, Johnny, about costs. I think, yes, costs are, are skyrocketing. But I, I again, I don't think, you know, I think that's just that's just costs in general. I don't, you know, I don't know that there's an easy, I mean, I didn't find as I said, uh, it any less expensive to have oil. So I think we, yes, I, I, I have to, we have the same concern, but um, but um, I was also just going to say that, um, you know, to his own admission, um, Mr. Hansel does not believe in, the, in our climate goals. He said that it wasn't something he believed, he wasn't doing it because he believed in it. So I think we may, you know, I think there's that, that tension too about what where do you think we're going and what do you think the cost of i um, mean if we if we want you know unless we want to change our climate goals in this city we need to do this to even be able to have a chance of meeting them and so that's why i'll leave it okay thank you thank you rachel um so real quickly jim and stan since you're on the on the committee do you feel like you can hold your questions for when we move on to discussion of the actual legislation after we I don't think we formally entered the public hearing open the public hearing uh, which is sure. I remiss but um, I can well I, I, um, Marissa I'd just like to to ask a clarifying question in response to Council LaBarge's suggestion that that perhaps uh, wider publication of this uh, wider notification of this topic uh, would be desirable. I, I agree that it's a huge, huge change and, and there's a lot of, or there should be a lot of public interest in it. I know that we originally had thought we might take this up at the July meeting of legislative matters, but that was uh, insufficient time to notify the public about this. And I'm just wondering, Marissa, whether you could address that or perhaps Laura, Laura our administrative assistant, could talk about how this meeting was um, publicized. Um, I, I will, I will say that the sort of discussions about where, when it landed on the agenda and 
and so forth were uh, involved with Councillor Jarrett, and uh, and I and I think Laura were part of that discussions and the general uh, summer time situation. Laura, you want to speak to that? The only thing I could say is that there was no publication requirement, um, and that the notice requirements for the hearing were a little bit unclear. Um, it, I think the DOER said that each municipality should use whatever its existing public notice provisions were. And we did discuss this with attorney Seawald and you know, he's, he wasn't quite sure what the DOER meant by that himself, but he said that, you know, he thought we should give at least seven and preferably 14 days of notice. Um, you know, we talked about how the fact for public hearings for poll petitions, we don't public uh, publish in the newspaper, we just make an announcement. And, you know, um, so yeah, there was no legal publication requirement is what I meant to say. Thank you, Laura. Okay, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Stan. Okay, I'm gonna make one last pass at folks who uh, from the public um, and notwithstanding that we didn't formally open a public hearing, um, I, I am going to, uh, after this next last round, uh, call the public hearing portion of this. Uh, I don't think I can close what was not formally opened, but move on to discussion of the, of the legislation itself among the committee. Um, Mr. Patillo, I, I have seen your hand up for a while. Oh, you're muted. Hmm. Okay. Hello. Yep, there you are. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Anthony Patillo. Uh, my son's name is Mark. Um, I live at Autumn Drive in Florence. Um, I retired from the city of Northampton as building commissioner in 2010. And what I'm hearing from contractors and from locals are they want to know what they're up against. And when the stretch code first came into effect, one of the issues was how is it going to be enforced? What were the requirements? There were prescriptive packages. The contractors want to do the right thing. Prescriptive packages were, were instituted. Questions have come up on existing structures. And a question came up on replacement of fossil fueled appliances such as heaters and furnaces and now they were told they would have to replace them that's not correct i believe that if you add a thousand foot addition on then you would be required if your furnace had to be replaced that would have to be made uh, electric or other compliant with doer is that correct uh, that sounds like Maybe a technical question for Lewis. Well, it, 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 it's a, it can add significant costs and also the whole issue of affordable housing, the maintenance of such systems are, are really important. We're making houses very tight, which is, which is good, which is keeping things in. But if you have a power failure and you have no air circulation because your heat exchanger isn't working, you can be producing more issues. The expression, the hell to road, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. People wanna do the right thing. We saw what happened in Maui. We saw what happened on the West Coast. We saw what happened in our neighborhood with floods. We do wanna do the right thing, but we have to live here. So the better we understand what we're up against, the clearer, we understand what we up up against, the better we are. There's a lot of agencies that are still fighting out what those technicalities have to be in the minutia, in the weeds. And they're looking at amendments, but they're also looking at the public to be the guinea pig. And we gotta look better at that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I uh, see uh, Barbara Rakoska. Yes. Hi. Hi. And thank Hi. you for this meeting and for allowing us to speak. Um, that was my question, like Tony asked, about replacement of a furnace or something. If, I, if someone needs to replace it in their home, are they going to be required to go electric? We need to know all these facts on what it's going to cost the Northampton homeowners before any big vote is taken, because that that could be very detrimental to a lot of people in Northampton. Um, I I spent four hundred dollars heating my home with with oil this year. We are very conservative. I honestly. Um, I do believe, I know back in the 70s, in the late 60s, early 70s, when Brookwood Drive and all those places were built all electric. I know of a lot of people that are on propane now because they couldn't afford the electric. And if we start building everything electric, like Tony said, we have a blackout or we have issues. Do we, or does the grid have enough to deal with it? And does the state have enough to help, you know, with all the electric? It's a, I, I honestly believe we need to do something, but I don't want to jump out of the pan into the fire to save us. Thank you very much. Great, but thank that, you. Yeah, we do need to know an answer to that. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Denise Lello, we've not heard from you. Thank you. Uh, Denise Lello, um, 35 Woodlawn Avenue in Northampton. Um, so uh, there were just a couple things I want to say quickly. One is in response to uh, uh, Councillor Labarge's um, concerns about uh, the cost of um, electric heating. Uh, I'm given the time frame you supplied for when you did your conversion, I think that a lot of progress has been made that you might not be aware of. Probably when you converted, you were doing um, uh, conduction heat in your house um, via electricity, which is an extremely expensive way to heat your house. Um, now there are electric heat pumps, which are great uh, and very efficient ways um, to um, heat and cool your house. And they are, uh, fine for our climate. Um, they're the most widely used source of home heating in the state of Maine, which is much colder than we are. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, this um, stretch code is, um, it's a um, opt-in stretch code that uh, really focuses on new buildings. So while it does apply to retrofits, Retrofits are very difficult. We know they're difficult. That's why we need to adopt this stretch code for new development. Because if we keep building our old type of building that we have to then retrofit, we are going to be faced with much fewer co higher costs than if we start now to um, electrify all our new buildings. This isn't something weird for Northampton. The city of Boston has adopted this. Many communities in Eastern Massachusetts have adopted this and they're larger cities and they have many more building issues than we do. So I really encourage people to be thoughtful and think about really um, uh, what we're doing for the future of Northampton here by taking this really small step of adopting this opt-in specialized code that will keep us um, um, sort of uh, abreast of what we've been doing up until now. We have been part of the um, stretch codes up till now, and there's no reason for us to step back from our attempts to address climate issues. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Um, uh, 
Uh, I'm going, this is the order to finish things up. Well, first of all, Miss Barbara, are you, is your hand still up because you want to speak again or because you? Because I'm looking on how to get rid of it. So I, okay. I okay. <laughs> all right. but all right. thank I'll you. Make a note of it and, and uh -huh. proceed no. Uh, I'm going to make the last last calls for public portions uh, in this order, uh, Mr. Henzel, Lewis, and then Adele. So, uh, John. Okay, I'm not trying to be argumentary. Yeah, I did say I don't believe in it because most electricity right now is made out of natural gas. I know we have hopes and dreams. It's all going to be made from the sun. But right now, and the infrastructure we have throughout this whole country is pathetic. Mm -hmm. The whole country is just a, it's a mess. Mm -hmm. And it really can't handle it all. And you can't change this overnight. It's got to be a slow process. And yeah, I do believe in the long run, but you just can't do it overnight. And uh, like I said, I'm not trying to be argumentary, but it's challenging for me when I listen to this because there's also things which Adele doesn't understand. When you increase the energy code, it's also on the building, not the electric. It's not the jet one that said much more to be. It's a cost of being and if you can afford the solar, well, you know, God bless you. That's another 30, 40 grand. I just did it uh, on a house in Federal Street. It cost me about 35 grand. Mm -hmm. um, but I could afford it. So the point is, it's, it's great for people that can afford it. Um, and like I said, in the long haul, it's going to be, it, it will work. But it's going to be a slow process. It's not a light switch you can just turn on or off. It's going to take time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lewis? Sure. Um, first of all, um, I, I opened my comments by saying this is necessary, and I believe it's necessary. I don't think we have an option. I take issue with the way it's um, with the code itself that we're working with, and it's going to take some time to sort it out, but um, we need to do something. I believe there, I, I do believe that as, as written, the code is so complicated that it's a lot of people can't grasp it. Um, and in terms of cost, um, to um, look on to what Eric said about the cost, the cost of um, um, greenhouse gases is huge. And, you know, what the effect of greenhouse gases has on the environment is huge. But I don't think it's fair to say that um, those costs are that 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 because I don't think it's fair to say that the energy that a, that an all electric home is less expensive, um, and at the same time say that it's more expensive, but the costs are um, worth spending. I, I really feel like we need to be more straightforward about it. And um, something that Tony picked uh, mentioned is that a prescriptive package. I mean, if what if there was a what if why didn't the energy code people say if you do X Y Z A B C and then D E and F you'll be set? People didn't have to figure things out. People didn't have to go through a whole bunch of um, machinations to get um, passive house certified. They just built a house. This is how you build it. This is the insulation you put in. This is the this is the heating system you put in, and then you're all set. Um, and it, w then we would have a really solid uh, way to estimate the difference in costs. I mean, we're sort of doing apples and oranges now. But again, this is inevitable. This is this is the right direction to be going in, and it's but it's going to be painful. Thank you, Lewis. Um, Adele, last remarks. I just want to point out that. Um, these new codes are about new construction. They're not about uh, what people are going to be forced to do in their existing homes. And, um, and therefore, um, there, there is, you know, if you renovate your home and that involves more than 50% of the square feet in your home, then yes, you would be subject to these new, the new stretch code. Um, but if you're just replacing your um, your heating system, that's that's not fifty more than fifty percent of your uh, square footage. Mm -hmm. So I just want to point out that what we're talking about here is there is no option to not 
adopt the new stretch code. There is, we do not, we cannot do that unless we decide to become, to not become a, a green community. So I don't see that happening. Um, but why would we continue to build homes and dig a deeper hole uh, with fossil fuels and that will increase our emissions and make climate change all the worse? We have to stop digging a deeper hole. Now, new buildings are a very small percentage of our building stock. So uh, any, in any case, uh, I think that this hearing is only about whether, not about the stretch code, because we have no choice but to adopt the stretch code. The, this hearing is about the opt-in specialized stretch code, which has very, very few differences from the stretch code that we will be forced to adopt. Thank you. Thank you, Adele. All right. Um, I don't... I. I think Tony wanted to speak. Uh, sure. Hello, am I still on? Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm sorry. I recently became blind and it's very difficult for me to manipulate this, so. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank please you. Be, please be patient with me. I agree that this is inevitable. We've, in our zoning before, have gone through an issue going from smaller lots to larger houses to larger lots, larger frontage, and now we're going backwards. The economy also drives this, and a lot of more people are living, want to live back at home, putting what's considered a minor addition on a small home would be more than 50%. They're looking at significant costs. And then also the maintenance of, the, of these new systems. Are we creating new products where we're creating new product chains that where the, the, the costs of these objects are going to come from? The lifespan of these new objects. You know, when we grew up, a washing machine or dryer would last 10, 15, 25 years. You're lucky now if you get 10 years of use out of one of these appliances now. What's it going to cost us? down the road to stay here and maintain existing structures with modifications for families to be able to stay here. But to blow it off and saying, well, if you increase by 50%, that's, that, that's fine. But this is not lo looking at reality and the people that are on the ground here and live here. They're really concerned about what it's gonna cost them to stay. And all I ask is that that be clear. We have to adopt the stretch code because we are part of a green community, but they're still fighting in Boston over the minutia and what amendments to add to this. And yet we're being asked to support this. Just be clear, that's all I'm asking. I'm fully for making our planet better. Been that way for more than 30 decades totally support that but i've also been in construction for 30 years as well and i have seen what this does and if you're clear what the requirements are made that up known it gets dealt with so much better and i don't think you're doing this now my opinion thank you thank you mr patello um all right i'm going to assume that barbara's hand is uh, just still up from her previous comment. And, um, no, I raised it oh. again. I'm sorry, but let someone else speak and then I will. Thank you. Uh, no. no, I think that's the, that's, that's, you're the only person remaining for the public. So if, if you could just briefly, uh, uh briefly, speak. if this is about adopting the opt-in for the specialized stretch code, I am reading what is Specialized Stretch Energy Code in Massachusetts. And the Specialized Code requires that buildings with fossil fuel systems must be pre-wired for future electrical systems. And for smaller buildings, must have solar. And I'm reading that as 
I would have to either go solar or I have to have my system upgraded for when my, uh, that's the way I'm looking at it. That's what it says. Um, SPET requires that building with fossil fuel systems must be pre-wired for future electrical systems. That, uh, I will let the, will let the oh, there's some of there's an echo. Um, that, as I understand it, and sponsors and Lewis and you can correct me, it's that's for new constructions or only remodels that involve adding more than 50% of the square footage. So it is not the case that if you if you um, need to replace your boiler or your any your HVAC system as part of it that it's just automatically that's what you're you're required to do all those things. So this this pertains to to uh, a much more limited um, spectrum of of construction. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. You're you're very you're very welcome. Um, and I am sure I'm sure to everybody in the public who continues to have questions. You know, we'll all be this will continue to be in front of us as counselors and those of us. So you know, feel free to to keep calling and asking questions and posing questions. Um, again, I didn't open a public hearing, so I can't close one. Uh, but I am going to move on and um, to. Um, to the, uh, the next agenda item, um, apologies for my, uh, <laughs> apologies for my lack of uh, uh, Robert's rules uh, issues uh, here, but uh, I'm gonna move on to the actual legislation and, <laughs> ask, mm -hmm. um, and ask if we, if I, any of the members of the committee um, would like to make a um, motion. for a recommendation of any sort. Jim? Can't hear you. He's muted. <laughs> and, but he's not muted. Is it Jim? Jim, he's out in the hallway because of the <laughs> echo. So he's, he's <laughs> get, maybe I could get a motion from somebody in the room who's, who's uh, microphone works. I can't. No, <laughs> I can't. Anybody? Hear what he's saying. Uh, yo, hang on just a second. I'm gonna go tell Jim. Nobody can. <laughs> oh God. No, I know. I found Jim. Hello, counselors. Hello. Well, let's turn this off so you don't see the back of my head. Okay. Okay. So um, I just have a bunch of uh, a few questions uh, for Adele and Louie. Okay. So first of all, um, just so I have it clear, the there's there's the base stretch code which is in effect right now. Um, and then coming down the, the, the pike is a, another level of the stretch code. And that's due to start, I believe, next July, if I have that right. And then we have the opportunity to opt in on an even higher level of that stretch code that's actually going to be coming down the pike, whether we like it or not, next year. Do I, do I have that right? Uh, no, I'm not quite. Okay. Um, my understanding. That's why is I'm that... asking Adele. <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked because I think that probably everybody is confused, um, and I apologize for not making it clearer. Uh, but the <clears throat> the the new stretch code is being phased in. And perhaps uh, Louis can clarify what part of it is in effect or what part is not. But in any case, it, it is supposed to be fully effective July of 2024. And it's currently being phased in. And we have the opportunity to uh, 
opt in to the specialized stretch code, which, which has only two additional provisions, which is to uh, pre-wire for future electrification only in new construction and, um, and, and for solar panels on the roof if, there's, if it's feasible to have solar on the roof. The, the, again, that's new construction only. So um, uh, I, whether the opt-in specialized stretch code will become part of a future stretch code that will be mandatory, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's very likely that someday that will happen. But in the meantime, it's not mandatory. We can opt into it. Is that so clear? Really what's so really what's up for discussion is whether or not we are going to opt into this extra version of the stretch code where where new construction will need to be required to have all electric hookup hookup to be pre-wired yes so that otherwise the rest of it is already coming our way that's exactly right thank you okay and so and what we're voting on is whether or not we're going to start enforcing those codes earlier than 2024. No, no, it's no, just for the What's been uh, given to your committee is the question of whether the city council should be encouraged to opt in to the new specialized stretch code. Okay, so we're the, now I've got it, Adele. <laughs> so it, it's really the vote is all about whether or not we're going to do this all electric requirement. It's um, it's not required to go all electric in new construction. There is a mixed fuel option with a with a um, with. Oh, a, I'm sorry. Stop, I, I want to. I'll stop you there because it's okay. the all electric hookup. That's it's, the only difference. In the for example. Um, there would have to be sufficient electrical panel to support an electric house. And then there would have to be an appropriate outlet by each fossil fuel appliance that would support an electrical appliance instead. That's it. Okay. No, I, so, um, and I, th I think we've answered the question about that, that it would apply to additions that are 50% the size of the current structure. Mm -hmm. And that would trigger in where somebody would have to adhere to these building codes. But there's also, uh, there are also local exemptions allowed. And so somebody could apply for an exemption if they didn't want to do it. And if they had a good enough reason, then the, the uh, city council could devise a process and uh, go ahead and approve it. Okay. And then one last thing to uh, Mr. Patillo was raising the, the what, what I heard was what we're doing to educate tradespeople. And Adele, you may not know the answer to this and uh, maybe Louie does, or um, it does seem to be that um, that could be something that we could be working on as we, if we do adopt this, is to educate people as to, you know, what the new code is. And, and would, it's a huge need statewide. And Mass Save is actually uh, aware of it and is supposedly developing some programs to train contractors. Um, well, but, if, maybe if we could help out with that, that we, I, we're just talking to the, we, you and I don't have control over this. Uh, so, which brings me to one last question, uh, which has to do with who is developing the new codes? These are coming down the pike from folks this is coming to us from the state. And, and Adele, years ago, I know we, we as uh, counselors were voting with the, I think it's called the ICC, you know, around regulations and stuff. The, the folks who are recommending these new codes, 
are are not just city councilors. They're not city councilors like me. They're actually engineers and, and folks who've been studying construction, correct? Well, it was DOER that uh, created these particular, new, the new stretch code and the opt-in specialized stretch code. They had a very, very long process and they certainly included um, a lot of energy experts and engineers. Okay, thank you. Because I, Mr. Hansel was pointing out that it, it's counselors making this decision right now, but the technical work that went into this was not counselors. These, these are people who understand construction, understand materials, understand, you know, and yes, we, we are up against some things here in terms of cost and things, but that, um, that it, no, it wasn't just some city councilors sitting around deciding to make things harder. And um, so, oh, it's, Louis' hand was raised. Um, You're the chair, go ahead. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Um, Louis had his hand up. Think we want to uh, sure. Couple of couple of quick things. First of all, existing houses. There, it's 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 equal to the an addition equal either a thousand square feet or as large as the house, a hundred percent. It's renovations, fifty percent of the house that starts to trigger. But but basically, there's there's very very low impact on an existing house. And, or an existing furnace or an existing stove or an existing water heater, at least at this point. So I, I think it could be take some comfort from that. Um, but I would take I, I would take issue with uh, the building code and the codes up until now re relating to buildings um, have been written by the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, and they've um, used the international code council model codes to base their codes on um, department of energy resources aren't contractors they're energy specialists and one of the things that a lot of people are not real happy about is that a lot of aspects of the energy code don't necessarily take into account some of the uh, niceties of the building code and they're coming from different places but again and I can't say it enough times we need to do this this is something, this is a direction that we need to go in. It doesn't mean that it's gonna be easy or pleasant. Um, and But I do think it's gonna shake out. I think that within a few years, a lot of the uh, people will be used to it. A lot of a lot of the issues will be changed. I'll stop now. Em, turn your mute. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you, Lewis. You. I don't know where the echo is coming from. Um, okay. I don't know where the echo is coming from. Okay, okay if I could I have, have a motion. motion. Is everybody is else getting that? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm getting that. That's yeah. bad. I think I blame Jim. He left the room, but there's still the echo. Hang on. Okay, Jim muted himself and that seemed to fix it. Hey Jim, why don't you just turn your um, thing off and come sit here next to me? I know, but I thought I had it fixed. Okay. I'll it. Okay. Um, okay. Thank, thank you everybody. Uh, Stan, I'm maybe hopeful you have a motion. I know you're hopeful about that, but I'm not <laughs> ready to make a motion. Uh, I have I have several things I want to say. Um, uh, I, I've listened to everybody, and I think everybody has made important and valid points. Uh, one of the words I've heard is inevitable. Uh, it is inevitable. Uh, we have uh, climate goals uh, for uh, uh, for zero carbon emissions that match the states by 2050. Uh, we're 27 years away from that. We have to, uh, with new construction, we have to think about 
how we're going to uh, reduce and eliminate fossil fuels. So this, this concept, uh, this opt-in stretch code that uh, requires uh, pre-wiring for electricity is what is needed right now. Um, there is, it is complicated and it is confusing and it, uh, it, it, it requires education. And I agree with everybody who, is, who has said that. Uh, we, the city has created a new climate action department. And I believe that, uh, that under uh, its leadership, working with people like the building inspector and others in the city, uh, it will develop a, a plan for educating not only contractors, but homeowners who have the same kinds of questions that we've heard tonight. I'm also concerned about uh, affordable affordability, and I've seen the uh, uh, I've seen the homeowners, uh, home builders, and remodelers association report that estimates uh, this would add uh, one, two to four percent to the cost of a, of a new house. I've seen other uh, I've seen other studies, the Rocky Mountain Institute, for example, did a study across the country of nine cities, including Boston which concluded that uh, all electric single family new construction, more economical to build and operate than a home with glass, uh, gas appliances and lower lifetime emissions. And I think that the, the key thing is to look at the life of, of the home. There will be some additional upfront costs, uh, but I think over the life of an all electric home, uh, those costs uh, will be less than heating with, with uh, with fossil fuel. Also, there are incentives uh, through Mass Save. Uh, uh, the Healy administration last or in June uh, uh, announced a new Massachusetts Community Climate Bank, which is getting 50 million from the Department of Environmental Protection uh, with a focus on affordable housing. So again, that's education about available incentives and subsidies uh, for uh, for uh, new construction that will help to keep it affordable. Uh, I, I am sympathetic to the to the to the concern that, that Council Labarge raised uh, earlier, though that here we are in the middle of the summer, uh, middle of August, uh, uh, and I, I and I'm not sure. I mean, I support this. Uh, and I I will uh, assuming that we eventually uh, vote on a recommendation. I will. I will vote to recommend it uh, with a positive recommendation, but I, I am sympathetic to the concern that perhaps not enough people knew about this meeting, uh, that other people uh, may, may wish to weigh in on this uh, before it goes to the council for a full vote. So I am, I'm, I'm, though supportive, I'm somewhat reluctant to move it to the council meeting this Thursday, uh, again, when we're in the middle of uh, August. Uh, so that's my, that's my, my, those are my feelings right now. Uh, yes, Councillor Nash. <laughs> Don't turn your microphone off. No, I'm looking at, yeah, so, um, I would like to make a motion that we send this to council with a positive recommendation uh, that um, I'm, I'm satisfied with all of the work that's gone on by uh, NASC and by um, the, uh, the building department and by um, uh, the city around making sure that th this is the right way to go. Um, the, uh, the, the only thing that I, um, I'm wondering about is, you know, did we get the word out? Um, I, you know, I, um, um, I, I know that Laura and I did a lot of back and forth around this and we, we reaching out to um, uh, Attorney Seawald around what exactly we should do. Should we post this in the paper? Should we do all sorts of stuff like that? Uh, the flyer was developed and um, that um, I, you know, I'm not sure how many people uh, learned about it. Uh, so, um, 
but I, I would like to see this go back to council with a positive recommendation. Um, I, you know, as the council president, I could um, do it uh, with the provision that we not put it on the meeting agenda for this Thursday uh, and rather uh, put it on the agenda for September 9th. Um, and that would give people a little more time to uh, to weigh in on it. We wouldn't be voting on it in the middle of summer. And that, um, uh, but I, I'd be open to that suggestion. Uh, but I, I don't see um, a reason to um, hold this up to get more feedback. So um, that's my thought. Uh, uh, I'll sec I'll second that with the provision that it be on the September 9th agenda rather than uh, or no uh, wouldn't it be the September 2nd agenda uh, President Nash it's September 7th 7th and the 21st for September for city council 7th 7th yeah the 2nd is my birthday so on the oh. 7th <laughs> <laughs> so the meeting will be on the 7th no the, with the, it's that's yes. already in the schedule. Yes. Yes. I would. So I, 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 I second the motion with that provision. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, it seems like everybody on the committee has uh, made remarks, um, except for me. I just want to add a couple of, of thoughts on this. Um, I, um, I am in support of this uh, uh, this legislation. It is consistent with the with the resolution that I already was uh, co sponsor with with uh, Rachel, um, and feel like this is the necessary thing to to move it along. Um, I I do, one thing I do agree with to some extent with Mr. Henzel and some of the other folks who raised the raised the point is that I I don't believe that arguments about cost or efficiency or savings are ever gonna win the day. It's too variable. It's the whole building process is too subject to many to many different variables that make it impossible to pin uh, down what is going to be less expensive in the future, or more expensive now and things like that. What I, and so I, so I can't disagree with that. I think given, depending on how things are constructed and if we're building great big single family houses, houses that are, you know, that our zoning allows at this point in time, um, that those energy costs and cost to build may well be very expensive. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't, I credit the sources that Adele cited um, on those points, but for, but for me, that's not the issue. Um, and, and, and I say this as I think, I hope everyone listening and who has seen my record and, and work I've done on council knows is that I'm very committed to housing and housing at every level of the market and 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 doing everything that we can do within our to 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 leverage our zoning laws um, to begin to encourage smaller buildings and multifamilies and uh, infill development and I stand by that very firmly. Um, the fact of the matter is is our planet is dying. We are all boiling. We're literally baking on this planet and we don't have time and our children don't have time for us to, I, sorry, I almost said a curse word, but we don't have time to mess around <laughs> with this. And, and I say that with great sympathy and, and, and as, as, as that everything that I can do as a counselor within that to address our housing needs, um, I am committed to doing, but we we cannot. We it's not a matter of being guinea pigs for this building code. It is a matter of being guinea pigs for what this climate change does to our planet and our city and our literal existence in the human race. I not to get too existential about it, but um, I so I can appreciate that these, you know, if if this were an ideal world, we it would be a slow process and we'd work out the kinks and there would be time, but there's just not time. Um, regarding whether or not the word has gotten out, I would say that between the resolution uh, that was previously passed between agenda items that were publicly announced on the NESC um, committee, which is also pub subject to public meeting, this meeting, and then of course, there's gonna be another opportunity. I'm very comfortable that we've had 
we've had not only public meetings about relevant legislation and discussions relevant to that, also um, as unanimously the council and our mayor ran on these climate goals and this agenda. Um, and so that we've had robust public discussion within the political sphere about this. So I um, am very, very comfortable. Um, I'm very comfortable voting for this. It's, uh, and um, I, I, I want builders to keep building we, and, and other ways that we can do to facilitate that. But, but um, I, we're not gonna meet our goals otherwise. And it, it's not, these aren't aspirational goals that we wanna feel good about. These are aspirational goals. These are goals that our literal lives depend on is how I feel about it. So, uh, okay. That being said, um, if there are no other remarks from the committee, um, I would call for a vote. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. All right, so that will go to city council and it'll be on the agenda for not at the next meeting, but September 7th um, with a positive recommendation. Um, and, and I do want to thank everybody who did come and everybody with, with such great expertise, uh, speaking to their expertise and their, and their, uh, knowledge. Um, and I also, I know I'm talking more than this to say, I, I do want to say that we all, um, I feel very strongly that those of us who live here and work here, there's just broad consensus about this as a priority and there's going to be disagreement in the details. Um, but I'm glad we're working through them. So um, there you go. Um, I think that's it for today. And I understand that my burrito at Veracruzana is ready. So motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. And Councillor Moulton. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Right. Thank you.